All right. <clears throat> so we uh, this is just a simple problem, like, kind of like a warm problem. It says that if you have uh, three vectors, you can express any other vector uh, in that span as a linear combination of those. So that's, that's what it means to be a basis. Uh, they say that this is supposed to be orthogonal. We didn't check, but if you double check, you should get, if you dot any two of these u1, u2, u3 vectors, then you should get zero. <laughs> well, it shouldn't be theoretical. It should actually work. No, we didn't. I just assumed. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, uh, definition, an orthogonal basis, um, orthogonal, an orthogonal basis for a subspace is a basis for W that's also orthogonal. <laughs> Didn't we talk about this? This is, feels like deja vu. There's a set, there's an essence of deja vu within the sentence already. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think the distinction a better distinction might be to say that if you have an orthogonal set, then you just have a set of vectors. If you have an orthogonal basis, then the bases are also linearly independent because it's a, a set doesn't necessarily mean that you're linearly independent. If you have an orthogonal, what? Oh yeah, if it's orthogonal, then it has to be. So this is more like a theorem here. Anyways. Uh, so I think this is where we left off. Yeah, so I think, yeah. Can you cancel one of the UJ? Uh, no, because this is a dot product. Yeah. Uh, but one over U doesn't make sense. Yeah. Nah, well. So, anyways, uh, so let's let's move to theorem number five here. It says that if you have an orthogonal basis, uh, so that means these are all orthogonal and linearly independent and all that. Um, <clears throat> for each y in w, uh, the weights of linear combination is given by this. So you know what we did over here? We, we used our, our uh, systems of linear equations. But what they're saying is that to actually find x, all you need to do is these dot products. I mean, to find the c1, c2, and c3s, all you have to do is find these dot products. So let's, uh, let's test it out. So use above example. So the above example, number 10. So we got C1 to be 4 thirds, C2 to be 1 third, and C3 to be 1 third. So let's, let's do this dot product business to see if it actually, we, we can continue to get the same result. So uh, C1, according to this, is Y. Well, that's actually the X value. So that's the X vector uh, dotted with U1 and then U1 dotted with U1. So the X vector is, uh, I'm just going to write them as like points just so it's easier to write out. Uh, 5, negative 3, 1 dotted with uh, 3 minus 3 and zero, and then the bottom is uh, three minus three, zero, uh, dotted with itself. So let's see what we have. We have 15, uh, 15, 
plus 9 plus 0. 15 plus 9 is 24. 24? And we have 3 and 3. Wait, 9 and 9 is 18. Uh, what is this equal to? Uh, 8, no, 2, no, 9, no, 6, which is, and it's just like what we had, except instead of dealing with the, with the matrices, we can just use those vectors and take dot products of those vectors. Yeah. Just use the dot product, yeah. Wait, I mean, uh, well, um, I don't know. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think we should just move on. <laughs> so, uh, orthogonal projection. Again, if you've taken Calc 3, this is something that you might have seen before. But the idea is that you, you're projecting uh, onto a particular, uh, from one vector to another. So the simplest case would be like in three dimensions. If you have a vector and then another vector, you want to project what onto what. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what u is. Uh, let's say this is u and this is y. <clears throat> so um, you can project this onto uh, the y vector, and again, with uh, <clears throat> with um, onto the u vector. Yes, you're projecting y onto the u vector, and so this is a perpendicular projection. So uh, in 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 calculus, you can use uh, three dimensional. Two, to, two or three dimensional representations of this. And then um, you can use stuff like the law of cosines or something like that to, to, to prove this. Uh, but <clears throat> when we're dealing with higher dimensions, the idea of sines and cosines and, and, and vectors being projected onto something in four dimensions is a little bit more difficult to visualize. And so let's just identify the, the components here. Um, <clears throat> So alpha, if you notice alpha and y hat, they look almost the same, except u is there's something uh, else involved in u. There's this little, um, there's vector. So y hat is a vector. So let's identify y hat as a vector. And the y hat is actually, uh, what they call the projection vector. Uh, orthogonal projection uh, say it again Y dot u. Y dot u is a scalar, so it's just a number. Not necessarily. There's something like the component and the projection. 
There's something that's not quite right here. Unless U is a unit length. So, what we have here is uh, is how alpha is how you're going to scale u to get y hat, which isn't necessarily the length. So I think that's the issue is that in calc three we looked at that coefficient as the length that's being scaled. So that's the difference. So. Alpha is what you multiply u by to get y hat. Now they introduce another vector here. Uh, z is y minus alpha times u. So you shrink alpha and then you shrink u by a factor of alpha, and then you subtract that from y. And so what you get is this vector. So z dot u and z dot y hat are equal to zero. So z dot u or z dot y hat is equal to zero to say that they're actually perpendicular orthogonal. So now the other thing about this is that sometimes people are interested in writing y as a linear combination of z and y hat. So then if you just look at this equation, solve for y hat, and y hat is going to be equal to y minus z. Or no, solve for y. Y is already solved for here. Y is going to equal to uh, y hat plus z. So z is equal to y minus y hat. And y is equal to uh, y hat plus z. Okay? So what we're doing here is we're trying to find a way to create uh, orthogonal vectors. So let's say you start off with uh, y and u. Then you can do a projection and then do a subtraction. And then now you have another vector z that's perpendicular to u. 
So that's kind of like what happened with, uh, it didn't work out like that exactly when the when we're talking to, about the Frenet frame. Uh, so, if you take a look at like a velocity vector and an acceleration vector that may not be perpendicular to each other, what you can do is you can project the acceleration vector onto the velocity vector and then come up with another vector that's perpendicular to the velocity vector. Now, this could be like your z vector. Now your z vector is perpendicular to the v vector. And now you, you shrink your, your, your v vector to call it your unit tangent vector. And then you shrink your z vector to be a unit vector. So you can call it the unit normal vector. And now you have the, the t vector and the n vector from your Frenet frame. And then one more vector, by crossing these two vectors, you get another vector that's perpendicular, and you get your third vector in your Frenet frame. Yes? Not, not, not quite. What we're interested in doing here is we're interested in finding a vector that's perpendicular to another vector. So you might have two vectors that are not perpendicular but you're interested in making them perpendicular and still span the same plane. So these two vectors are on the same plane and I just want to make one of them to be perpendicular to the other. So I'm going to replace this vector with this vector and now I have two vectors that are perpendicular. And that's basically what we're doing here. Okay, and what we're going to do is do it with a third vector. And the fourth vector, if we're talking about R4 or higher. Okay. <laughs> so the applications will stay with 3D. I think it's... it's <laughs> Well, I guess we can find a use for it. Because the uses for it are beyond the scope of this class. Beyond the scope of me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's find some applications next time. <clears throat> Uh, oh, God. Yeah, she's bored with that application. She said it's obvious. <laughs> dimension. Well, we'll see. I did have some, I did have a worksheet for you guys for tomorrow or next time kind of prepared. What is it? So the idea is that you guys were going to be flying ships and then each of you guys have a ship that you're flying and then each of those ships have vectors, three vectors that are not necessarily perpendicular. And you guys were to find an orthonormal basis for that. And once you do that, you have to figure out the coefficients to hit the target, which is the origin. See if you guys can do that tomorrow or Wednesday. <laughs> Anyways, so that's, that's 3D, pardon me? I uh, suppose you can. I think these things have MATLAB, right? So maybe as part of what you guys are doing when you're working in groups, you guys can use that just to make your work go faster.
All right, we are, uh, where are we? We're here, orthonormal sets. So now we're going to start talking about not just orthogonal sets, but ortho, orthonormal sets. And you know that phrase, when we normalize a vector, we essentially um, make it of unit length. An orthonormal set is a set whose vectors are all orthogonal and they all have unit length, which is uh, what we want to push towards. Uh, the, the simplest example of creating an orthonormal set is, is called the well, the standard basis vectors. In, in three dimensions, the IJK, IJK vectors are all perpendicular to each other and they all have unit lengths. Yeah. Yes, those TNB is another one. So that's the Frenet frame we're talking about. That's also an orthonormal set of vectors. Okay, because they all have unit lengths. All right. <clears throat> so. We want to get to this idea of an orthonormal set, and now we haven't talked about matrices in a while, so uh, let's talk about a matrix. If you have an M by N matrix that uh, has orthonormal columns, then it turns out that if you take the product of that matrix with its transpose, then uh, you're going to get the identity. Kind of, kind of weird, huh? Yeah. If it's not the same thing, right? So let's see if we could do this. Um, let's see if we can prove this. I don't know if I was going to prove this in my notes, but, but anyway. Delilah basically said the proof, right? So if you have a let u1 through un uh, n, n. be orthonormal, then it's orthogonal. And orthogonal means that u1 uh, multiplied with u, or let's say ui multiplied with uj is equal to is equal to zero if i does not equal to j. What if i was equal to j? <laughs> Then, well, if it's ortho orthogonal, then it's not necessarily one. But if it is orthonormal, it is going to be one. So if ui is dotted with ui in general, do you remember what this is equal to? Remember what v dot v is equal to? What's squared? It's the norm, right? It's the norm squared. So this is, in general, if you have an ortho orth, orthogonal, an orthogonal set, then this is really the only property is that when you take the dot product of two vectors that are not the same, you're going to get zero. Now, in general, if you take the dot product of two things that are the same, then you're going to get the magnitude squared. But if it's an orthonormal set, then ui dotted with ui is going to equal to 1 because it's a unit vector. So now, if the u vector or the u matrix is made up of these column vectors, u1, u2, un, and then we can write the transpose to be basically 
u1, u2, un, right? So we multiply ut with u. This is going to be equal to um, so ut, we take u1, and then we're going to dot it with u1. That's the first component. We're going to take u1, dot it with u2, uh, etc. u1, dot it with un. We're going to take u2, dot it with u1, u2, dot it with u2, etc. And then all the way down to un dotted with u1, un dotted with u2, etc. And then you can see that we've shown that if they're orthogonal, these are all equal to zero. And then if they are the same vectors, in an orthonormal set, then these are all equal to one. So what you have left here is the identity. You can dot it, you can multiply it with its transpose, and then if you get the identity, then yeah. Yeah, well, it doesn't, yeah, if and only if, so yes, you can make that conclusion. Okay, so that's an interesting fact about orthonormal basis when we connect it with matrices. So not only can we make a basis out of it, but now when we make it into matrix form, we can multiply them and then you get the identity. Yeah. If it's uh, an n by n matrix, so right now we're not saying it's a square matrix, but if it was a square matrix, it could be a basis for R n. Yeah. Well, if it's not a square matrix, then you either have if it's not a square matrix, then you're you you might be missing some some vectors. All right. Um, there's another theorem. That talks a little bit more about um, matrix relationships with orthonormal sets. Let U be an N by N matrix with orthonormal columns. And then uh, x and y be some random vectors in Rn. Then, uh, if you multiply the matrix with any of these vectors, then you're only going to get the length of the vector. This this uh, u times x will result in a vector, so the magnitude is just the length of that vector. So if we think about u as some sort of um, What's that called? Transformation? As a matrix transformation, you're going to take u, or you're going to take u, you're going to take x, the vector, put it through u, and then that gets transformed into another vector. And it turns out that the magnitude of that transformation is going to be just the magnitude of x. So what this is saying is that as a transformation, this is not going to change the length of x. Preserves length. Not necessarily direction. Uh, you could think about the rotation matrix as something that preserves the length, but then the direction now changes. Um, <clears throat> if you apply x, apply u, then the dot product of this new vector, these new vectors, is the same as the dot product of the original vectors. So if, if you have a, a transformation again, and the transforms 
x and y into some other space, then the dot product of them will still be the same. Yeah. So the Mm -hmm. And then the dot product of ux and uy is the same as the dot product of x and y. All right. <clears throat> Um, the projection, it's a, it's a transformation, so it's not really necessarily getting projected. Yeah. Oh, it's still going to be the same, yes. All right, uh, here they call it a definition. I think based on the last theorem, it could have been a theorem also, but here it says uh, if you have an orthogonal matrix, um, orthonormal matrix, it turns out that um, the transpose is equal to the identity. So if you have a square matrix, then you take its transpose, and it's an orthonormal matrix, you take, you take its transpose, then remember that u, or that u transpose times u was equal to the identity. Well, it turns out that it'll work the other way around, and so therefore it must be the inverse. So the transpose of an orthogonal matrix must be the inverse of that orthogonal matrix. Now, the word orthogonal actually means orthonormal when we're talking about matrices. So when they say orthogonal matrix, it's assumed that you're actually talking about orthonormal. So not only are the columns orthogonal to each other, but they also are all of unit length. Okay. Uh, just then they just uh, just a matrix, yeah. So if you have uh, columns that are orthogonal, they still don't call that orthogonal matrix because it has to have it has to be make sure, yeah, make sure it's orthonormal. You have to be, yes, for it to be called an orthogonal matrix. I'm <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Brian's not happy with that. Right. Yeah. Yes. I don't know why. I think it's just people that when they talk about matrices, they they jump the gun on this. All right. Um, let's talk about orthogonal projections now. We talked about orthogonal projections between two vectors, but now uh, let's generalize this idea to talk about orthogonal projections between a vector and an actual orthogonal space. So not just one vector onto another vector, but a one vector onto a whole space that's perpendicular, that it's supposed to be perpendicular to. So this is uh, the next section already, 6.3. All right. Let's see if we can make sense out of this. Uh, if you have a vector y in a subspace and y is not necessarily on that vector, then there exists a vector y hat in that space such that one y hat is some unique vector and that's uh, where y minus y hat is orthogonal and y hat is a unique vector that's closest to y. 
And the best visual for this would be in 3D. We, we try to do this in two dimensions, then it's like one vector projecting to another vector, and then that's we saw that already. So let's try to picture this in three dimensions. Um, the points, the tips of the arrow, they're all settled at the origin. They're all in standard position. Then the tips of the arrow are the closest distance to each other in terms of the distance. So let's say we're, we're in uh, R3. And then we're talking about subspaces and stuff like that. So let's keep all the subspaces as if they're going through the origin because the subspace goes through the origin. So let's say it's not necessarily the XY plane, but um, let's say some other plane that passes through the origin. So if you want to do... <laughs> Do hidden, what do you call it? Background hiding. I don't know what I'm talking about now. I want to erase. <laughs> what am I doing? I should just draw this on the computer. That's what I wanted to try to do. So anyways, this is a plane going through the origin. And let's draw another vector uh, that's not necessarily on the plane. So another vector that's not necessarily on the plane. I wanted to do that in a different color. So what we're saying is that the plane would be the subspace that we're talking about, W, and then we have a vector, Y, right? So what we want to do is we want to project this onto the plane perpendicularly, <laughs> perpendicularly, the word, orthogonally. So what we want to do is we want to project this on the plane so that we have an orthogonal projection on the plane. Okay? So on that plane, what we have is y hat, where y hat is a unique vector in W, so that y minus y hat, let's see, what's y minus y hat? You just connect the tails, right? is perpendicular to W and Y hat is a unique vector that's closest to Y. So this distance over here is the shortest distance possible. That's what that's saying. Okay. So what they're saying is that if now if you have a space and then you have another vector and you want to create another vector that's perpendicular to that space that you have now, then, then you can find it by help by ha by finding y hat. If you can find y hat, then then you can help you can find that that vector. Yeah. Because we want to create an orthogonal set, we might have a set of vectors. That, that forms a basis, but they're not orthogonal. And so we might want to find an orthogonal set. Which gives you the Frenet frame if you're looking at it in three dimensions, for example. Well, it helps you find shoot targets and stuff like that. I don't know. <laughs> or something that we're going to find by Googling in four dimensions. 
So do you get the picture? Get the idea? Kind of. Yeah. Closest just means that uh, this, this is the shortest distance here. Yeah, it's not like another vector over here. And now this is a little bit longer to deal with. And not orthogonal. Better erase all that stuff. <clears throat> okay. All right, so how are we going to do this? Uh, we're going to do this by an orthogonal decomposition. So this is the... the Algorithm. This is actually a piece of a bigger algorithm that we're going to look at. But for right now, let's just talk about obtaining a space already, W, and we want to find another vector that's perpendicular to W. So theorem 8 says that if you have W, some subspace, and then you have a, a vector Y, which is not necessarily in W, then y can be written as uh, y hat plus z, where y hat is in w, and z is actually perpendicular to w. So back to this picture, when they refer to in the theorem uh, the vector z that's perpendicular to w, which is to say that it's in w perp, then that's what z is. z is equal to y minus y hat. So, um, in fact, if u1 through up is any orthogonal basis of w, then y hat, remember y hat is in w, is going to be uh, the projections of y onto all those different vectors. <laughs> Can you picture that? orthogonal vectors in W. Oh, yeah, the orthogonal basis of W can be any. Right. Yeah. But we could probably find them to be perpendicular to each other. Yeah. No, they don't have to be, but we will find them so that they're perpendicular. Oh, yes, if they're orthogonal basis. Sorry. Yeah. So, <laughs> what? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's take a look. Let's see. Um, let's say let's say we have these three vectors. And these three vectors are not necessarily perpendicular to each other, right? They're just three vectors. Let's call this um, x1, x2, and x3. 3D. These, this is in three dimensions. Uh, they span the whole, the whole space. So this thing spans everything, which means they're all linearly independent from each other. Okay, so now what we're going to do is let's take a first take a look at x1 and x2. So x1 and x2 span a plane. Okay, so let's try to draw the plane that they span. So x1 and then x2 span a plane, right? Let's call this plane W. Right? 
So we have x1 and x2 span a plane that we're calling w. Now, x1 and x2 are not necessarily perpendicular, right? So what we can do is that we can do the projection and then create a new vector. So create this vector that's going to be perpendicular to x1. We'll call that vector v2. Well, we're not doing cross products. It'd be, it'd be nice and easy to do that, right, in three dimensions. But unfortunately, it doesn't extend to higher dimensions. So uh, we're not going to do the cross product yet. So now we can say x1 is orthogonal to v2 and still span the plane w. So now we can think about x1 and v2 as that orthogonal basis vectors for w. Now I have x3. I have x3 and I want to find another vector that's that's perpendicular to w. So this is how I would do it. Actually, this is how I did the first one. It's just by this projection. But now if I have two vectors, I want to project it onto w, then I will have two of them. So let's let's be clear on what I'm trying to say here that v2 is equal to x2 being projected onto x1. So v2 being projected onto x1 means that v2 is equal to this. Now to find x3, or to find another vector perpendicular to that, I could take my x3 and then I'll project it onto x1 and also project it onto x2 or v2, yeah. So that's what this is. Well, the w or the, the the u u hat will be projected onto x1 and v2. Yeah. Oh, it's not. It'll be what minus what? Yeah. So what should v2 equal to? x2 minus this thing. Thank you. You were thinking that. You didn't say it. So now, so that's, we, we, so we need to take this in steps. We need to get hat first. Why hat first? And then we, we can find the actual v3 in this case. So now let's redraw this picture. Should have done this on the left side. So let's redraw this picture. So I have x1 and v2 here. These are both on the plane. I don't know if v2 looks like it's coming out of the plane. It's actually on the plane. Right, and then so now we have a new vector, uh, another vector, x3 right here, right. So what we want to do is we want to project x3 onto w. Is 
this is W. We want to project X3 onto W. And to do that, we need to find this Y hat vector. And that Y hat vector is going to be um, basically some scalars times X1 and then some another scalar times V2. So Y hat is going to be some scalar times X1 plus some other scalar times V2. Now, what are those scalars? Those scalars are just the projections. So this is Y hat is actually equal to uh, X3 being projected onto X1. So x3 dot x1 over x1 dot x1 times x1. So this whole thing here is your component projection. Plus x3 dotted with x2 over x2 dotted with x2 times v2. I guess we should call this v. Okay. V2 is in W, is on in W. Yeah. All right, so uh, we're out of time, but I'm going to post the rest of the notes here, and uh, we're going to try to mimic this idea. Uh, I'm going to do another example next time, and then uh, you guys are going to try to create your your spaceship problem hitting the target. <laughs>